thanks so much everyone for being here. Um, I'm very, I personally was very excited about putting this workshop together. Um, obviously the point of this summit is not only to educate, but to um, figure out ways to take action. And there are so many organizations that are working not just on climate catastrophe, not just on US militarism and imperialism, but the both and how they are so deeply intertwined. And these represent just a few of the organizations that are working on that intersection. Um, <clears throat> we are gonna be having four organizations re uh, represented here today, including the Kappa Climate Group, uh, the Illinois Climate Caucus, Rising Tide Chicago, and the Sunrise Movement. And it's also worth noting, there were two other organizations that um, unfortunately could not be here today, um, uh, Extinction Rebellion Chicago and Dissenters. And for those who don't know, Extinction Rebellion is a direct action-based climate group and Dissenters is a youth-led anti-war movement working to end. Currently their main project is ending the Boeing arms genocide. Um, I think we can go ahead and get started. I'm gonna start out by just having folks talk for four to five minutes about their organization and what they do. Um, I'm probably just gonna go in alphabetical order for the names of the group. So that would start us with the Kappa Climate Group. So Jesse. Hi, I'm Jesse Bradish, uh, she, her. I live in Evanston. I lived lots of places before, but since I moved to Evanston, I started working with Kappa and Kappa has been great for doing a lot of community organizing. Kappa has like gotten a stage and a speaker system and gets people out to the events. And it's just been great to partner with them while I'm trying to build some like local community action. So hopefully we can talk about that. And I know Angie from Rising Tide and I know Ivy from Extinction Rebellion, but we're sort of a loose group of people. I came today to talk about specifically what Cap is doing in Evanston right now with the series of protests we've, or actions we've done and what we're planning to, hoping to do in 2022 and definitely looking for more people to partner with. So if we've been a bigger group, obviously climate change, migration, peace, security, all that stuff, very important. Um, and CAP are really, currently I think is also really focused on what's going on in Ukraine, you know, with gas prom, like it's not always local, but what we've been working on is local pipeline issues. Uh, and local water issues. So we've been working on line three and line five. Uh, if you're familiar with them, these new pipeline expansions in Minnesota and in Michigan uh, and in Wisconsin that go under the Mississippi River, that go under the Great Lakes, like crazy ideas, new pipelines they're building to break down tar sands. Um, and so our goal was to get attention and get media coverage. So we're kind of taking an outsider's perspective trying to be agitators. So this was up, up, up at the treaty people gathering last summer. I don't know if any of you followed it, maybe we'll talk about it, but they were trying to stop them from constructing this new pipeline expansion, this new line three that went through 200 bodies of water and through treaty territory. But unfortunately, Enbridge rammed it through, uh, you know, injured a lot of water protectors and those people are still in the courts and it's turned on, but they could always turn it off. So that's something we're interested in the summer. The first, the first action that we did, the first event we did was in the park right by Lake Michigan. We had like 70 people come out. We had local politicians there that seemed really engaged and wanting to do something about the Great Lakes. And it was an Honor the Earth fundraiser uh, for Honor the Earth, the nonprofit that Winona LeDuc started. Uh, we raised like a thousand bucks and plus everybody had a really great time. And um, we got to hear from some real frontline water protectors like this person here who had actually been hit with a, with a rubber bullet, like crazy stuff happening up there. Um, and then we started doing a series of trying to get Chase to divest. So Stop the Money Pipeline is trying to get Chase to stop funding these pipelines. They are the top funder of all of the new fossil fuel projects. So there's been actions in Chicago, actions in Evanston. We've done like five different actions. We did one on Black Friday, and then we've been meeting once a month. We got some great signs. We had some pretty decent coverage. Like it was 14 degrees and people were still showing up. We were on ABC once. So feels like there's some movement there, but also like, what are we really trying to do? Uh, I've recently come to the assumption Jamie Dimon's probably not going to take our calls, the CEO of Chase. But the, that, that, so that's still happening this summer. Stop the Money Pipeline, trying to get customers to talk to their banks. Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Chase, and Citibank are the top four. And there's a lot of information on that, like Rainforest Action Network put together a really great climate chaos report. And there's a lot of strategies about trying to engage 
like line level people at the branches to educate them to create sort of a morale issue, a company wide morale issue during this great resignation where people are like, oh, we're the worst. We're literally the worst climate murderers of all of the banks. Like, oh, maybe I don't want to work here anymore. Or maybe I'm going to talk to my boss. So there's just a lot of really interesting emergent strategies. But my main goal is like stop these new fossil fuel pipelines. There's also a carbon pipeline in Illinois. Um, so we're like, stop the pipelines, protect the water, save the planet, capital climate group. It's been fun. They bought, they bought, they made the stage, they bought this speaker system. So I just think it's a nice, nice group of people to partner with. And I don't know what everybody else wants to do who's here, but we'd hopefully like to get like more coverage, more action, and maybe we'll work on some more even direct local issues, but that are around like water and climate. Um, and that's what I've got. Thanks. All right. Thanks so much, Jesse. Um, and from that, we'll go to the Illinois Climate Caucus, which is Carolyn. Okay, I'm going to try sharing my screen and see what happens. Okay, so um, I uh, can everybody see my screen now? Yep. Okay. Um, so I've been uh, primarily an anti-war uh, on Yemen activist um, and moved back to Illinois um, a couple of years ago and got involved with um, Rachel Ventura's campaign for Congress. She was challenging Bill Foster, who in spite being the only scientist in Congress is not supporting Green New Deal. Um, uh, instead, he's supporting uh, cap carbon capture uh, technology, which has been shown not to work. Um, so I was working on her campaign and got connected in with um, a gentleman from Naperville uh, by the name of Greg Hubert. Um, and his presentation is what's on the screen right now. Greg um, and uh, his group called Clean, Clean Energy Alliance of Naperville has been working on uh, what's called the Muni and co-op issues with the uh, electrical grid in Illinois. As some of you might know, um, but I'll just go into it briefly. Last September, so it's September 2021, uh, Illinois passed uh, kind of groundbreaking legislation called CJA. Um, is everybody aware of that or should I go into it? Anyone not aware? Okay, so I'll go into that just a tiny bit. Um, it basically uh, is to bring uh, coal-fired electricity uh, in Illinois down to net zero by 2030. Um, and so that legislation was uh, signed by our governor. The great thing about the legislation also is that there was some focus on um, making sure that the transition to renewable energy was done in a, uh, in a just way, um, racially, economically. Um, however, um, one of the things that the legislation didn't um, get to address was the municipal and co-op owned electrical grid. So 10% of Illinois' Uh, electricity is owned by municipal uh, organizations, basically cities, um, with Naperville being the largest. And they are organized into uh, different groups and they, um, the, the, the big one in Illinois is called the IMEA. So I'm scrolling down. IMEA is here. And then 32 member, 32 cities are members of the IMEA. And then this, this round uh, cir uh, oval circle up here, that's called the Prairie State um, Electricity Campus. So IMEA is, is one of the largest owners in Illinois of the Prairie State Electrical uh, Campus. That is a coal-fired electric plant and it is not um, falling under the the jurisdiction of the CJA legislation that's passed. So they're going to be allowed to, to continue uh, generating electricity from coal fired um, process until 2045. 
And so our organization is attempting to drive awareness first within the city of Naperville because it, it is the first, or is the largest city contributing to this ownership of the Prairie State. Um, but then we're also going to try and reach out to some of the larger um, municipal um, owned owners. Um, Batavia is one and St. Charles is the other. And I think Waukegan is another big one. Um, and the reason for that strategy is by targeting the largest owners, we may be able to get them to exert pressure over the IMEA uh, leadership. Right now, every city has one vote, but if we can get three uh, to four to five cities to dissent, um, then it's switched to weighted voting. And so the, the largest consumers of the electricity can um, then maybe exert pressure on IEMEA to divest from Prairie State. It's a little bit of a daunting process. We're not sure that we're gonna uh, be successful, but um, we think it's important to try and we think it's important to educate people about what's happening. And um, one of the strategies that we came up in our first uh, meeting was to work with precinct committee people to help us uh, get them word out. So um, in the state of Illinois, we have townships um, that are, I think, six by six square miles. Um, and the township chairs are responsible for appointing precinct, precinct committee people to any precinct that doesn't have an elected person in place. Um, a precinct committee person's job is to go around to all the voters within their voting district um, a couple of weekends before elections and to let them know what's on the ballot and to get out the vote. You have precinct committee people for both the Democratic Party and for the Republican Party. Um, so they're, they're two separate groups that are going out trying to round the vote. But what they do is even if they're not able to talk to a voter, they drop off literature. Um, and so we have been um, in the process of creating literature that will go out with this year's primary and general election with the precinct committee people. Um, it's a strategy I never would have thought of as far as organizing goes. Um, but I think it could end up being really successful because we can do a lot with just five people in our organization at the moment um, because we're tapping into and creating alliances with um, the, the political infrastructure that's already in place. Um, and if a precinct committee person it doesn't want to help us, it's only a small section of the township that's not getting coverage. So um, we're going to try to expand this strategy to um, talk to people outside of Naperville about how the fact that the people who have ComEd and Ameren as their electrical uh, uh, suppliers, they're paying anywhere from $35 upwards a year that Naperville residents and, and other cities don't. And, that, and that's, those fees are to go towards supplementing renewable energy um, because um, the Illinois has treated the group, the group separately, Naperville doesn't have to pay those fees. So Naperville's getting out of, a, the Naperville residents in totality are probably getting out of paying $5 million a year into this fund. And so we wanna get residents who are um, outside of Naperville to know that this is happening and it's not just, and we might be able to apply uh, pressure at a state legislative le level next January. So in totality, I just wanted to give people a little bit of information about uh, the electrical system here and what we're trying to do to, to um, close down Prairie State sooner than 2045, to have people think about using precinct committee people if you live in a state with uh, townships um, as part of your organizing structure. Um, and, um, and also just to think like you can go top down and bottom up at the same time. Thank you. Thank you so much, Carolyn. Um, and with that, we will go over to Rising Tide Chicago, which is Aaron. So, and also Aaron, thanks for, I know we had a last minute switch, so thanks for doing that. Yeah, no problem. So I did not make a PowerPoint. I just have some notes on my phone, um, but yeah, I'll tell you 
a little bit about Rising Tide Chicago. Um, we are a group that confronts the root causes of the climate crisis with direct action and education. Um, root causes are things like capitalism, colonialism, and white supremacy to the, that are also root causes of um, a lot of other issues. Um, we organize for environmental justice and act in solidarity with frontline groups that are most directly impacted. And we hold direct action trainings to empower other groups with the skills to take action in their communities. Um, so we were doing a lot of solidarity actions um, against the banks that were funding line three. Um, we are also part of that same long-term campaign that uh, I believe Jesse was talking about earlier against Chase Bank because they're the largest funder of fossil fuels in the world. And um, so we've been mostly doing the direct action trainings recently online. Um, a lot were focused on people who either wanted to go um, to the front lines of the um, line three movement or um, do solidarity actions in their own communities um, against like a, a bank or maybe an Enbridge office. Um, and then we've also done some teach-ins and some film screenings um, recently also um, focusing a lot on line three um, and getting more people aware and wanting to take action. Um, so some other things that we've been doing recently, um, we've been working with some people in Rockford who are fighting to save Bell Bull Prairie, um, which is, um, it has a lot of endangered species, including the rusty patch bumblebee. Um, there's a proposed airport expansion um, for Amazon and other um, like delivery um, trucks to go through. They, they already have a road to the airport. This is just more convenient to go through the prairie. Um, and so, um, yeah, in the name of capitalism and profits, they're um, threatening this biodiverse ecosystem, which um, bio biodiversity is really important to mitigating the worst effects of climate change. Um, and also, you know, the other way, like destroying it um, makes it worse. So, um, yeah, Rising Tide is um, interested both in finding new members and also um, finding opportunities to work with other groups um, and connect because, um, yeah, our struggles and our movements are all interconnected. Um, I have some contact, contact info and social media and websites and stuff that I'll just put in the chat. Um, but yeah, and we've, um, some of us have gone to um, like the teaching about the Boeing Arms genocide campaign. Um, we're really interested in working with, um, with folks um, who are doing that. We kind of had, um, we're busy with a lot of other things recently, um, but yeah, so excited to connect with you all. Thank you, Erin. And yes, definitely, if you're interested in getting more involved with BAG or the Boeing Arms genocide, I can get you in touch with folks. Um, they've actually had some really big wins. Um, so there, if anyone here wants to get involved, please definitely reach out to me. Um, I can put my email in the chat and connect you to folks. I'm actually wondering, and so Gary, I know you're here and you actually messaged me privately about some really great stuff Veterans for Peace is working on. This is very much putting you on the spot. So if you don't want to do this, you don't have to, but I'm wondering if you'd like to talk about what you are working on with Veterans for Peace for a little bit. Absolutely, that's why I'm here. I, great, perfect. Really great to hear what everybody else is doing. And um, I'm a member of the San Diego Veterans for Peace. I was drafted in 1967, way back when. Um, I'm also a member of San Diego 350.org. And it became apparent to me and others within our group of aging people that many climate activists who are doing excellent work locally uh, are undereducated or have a, less than a, a good appreciation of the military's contribution to the climate crisis. Would, would you let me share screen? Yeah, I, hang on, I might, you might have to wait a minute because I would have to ask Charles to give you co-host capability. So I got to contact him first, but I will be in the process of doing that one moment. Okay, well, about a year and a half ago, we had a virtual convention and a group of us got together and formed uh, a, 
a project called Climate Crisis and Militarism and how they're connected and uh, they're both existential threats if you really take in the whole nuclear picture and everything. But we've put together a, a PowerPoint presentation uh, with an eye towards educating peace groups about the climate contribution and climate groups about the military's contribution. And as an example, uh, we, well, we've given over 50, 55 of these presentations via Zoom, and we will talk to church groups, peace groups, sustainability groups, um, local 350 groups, and the response has been very positive. And, and in fact, I'm working with Massachusetts Peace Action to do a joint presentation with Mass Peace Action and Mass 350. Now, we, we did one with New Jersey uh, about two or three weeks ago and had, a, I think we had 55 people show up. And so uh, we're not asking climate activists to drop what they're doing, but we want to give them a better appreciation for the military's contribution. I mean, the military is the single largest institutional consumer of fossil fuels, and hence the single largest institutional emitter of greenhouse gases. And, you know, we can't, as a climate activists, we can't stick our heads in the sand about that. And I live in San Diego, and we often call it the belly of the beast because of the military presence here. But I see that in local climate action uh, programs and projects that are done at the local level, there's never a talk about what the military produces in the way of greenhouse gases. You know, uh, the, the, the citizens are asked to reduce and, and to be aware and to get involved, but the military seems to have a blank check. And it also has a blank check when it comes to spending our tax dollars. So we focus on pollution and we focus on tax dollars and how it's wasted. And, and we want to get rid of this aura that it's unpatriotic to talk about how severe this problem is. And uh, we have been successful. Uh, we have been in, uh, we've worked with Congresswoman Barbara Lee's office, and she's put forth a House resolution. It's HRES 767, and I'll, I'll drop this in the chat when I'm done here. But she's demanding uh, full transparency of reporting of all military emissions with an eye towards reduction to get in line with what the Paris Accords put forth. And we talk about some of the history of why uh, this knowledge about military emissions has been under the radar. I mean, the, the, the government has actively lobbied to exempt reporting of military emissions. And this goes back to the Kyoto Protocols um, in 1995, where the U.S. lobbied and, and got many military emissions exempted from a country's reporting, and then the U.S. never never signed on anyway. And the Paris, Paris Accords weren't much better, and then we talk about what happened at COP16 and, and you know, in, or 26, excuse me. So we, we put together a, a lot of data, but we created a robust website with resources and such, and we want climate people to be better educated about this aspect. We want everybody to be aware of how our tax dollars are being spent. And we've all got to put pressure on our on our representatives. I mean, both Republicans and Democrats uh, routinely write a blank check to the military. I mean, the top five, you know, Raytheon, Boeing, Lockheed Martin, um, and their, their CEOs average 20 million dollars a year compensation and it's obscene it just goes unchallenged you know we've got an airplane that costs a hundred million dollars for one and it's a cost plus agreement so it's a matter of education 
uh, we feel that we have a, a unique perspective uh, from our group as being primarily veterans. You don't have to be a veteran to join us. We have associate members who are very active. Uh, we've done stuff with Code Pink. Uh, we're going to have a national webinar on Earth Day uh, to look at this topic um, on the 22nd, and, and I'll forward some information on that as that becomes clearer. But uh, it's, it's something we've all got to talk about. It affects us all. Uh, we don't expect everybody to drop everything they're doing and say, you know, we want to join your group. But, but having this knowledge gives stuff a bigger perspective. When we talk about where can we get money to finance the Green New Deal and have a just transition, I mean, that pot of money, I mean, they write checks easily. So the money's there. We just need to develop the political will. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gary. Um, thank you to all of our presenters for taking the time to put together these presentations and to be here today. Um, I really hope this can be an opportunity um, for greater solidarity work. And this is helpful for me um, with Kappa as well, especially as I um, think of ways to get my students involved uh, with a lot of your organizations. I know a lot of them um, are very interested in these subjects. Definitely, Erin, um, you might be interested in contacting or getting in touch with the Loyola chapter of Kappa because that's their main campaign is actually to stop line three right now. Um, but Nina, I know you are a attendee. So do you have any questions for the speakers you'd like to ask? Oh, thank you. No, thanks. I, I was most concerned about getting links to follow up and check out their information more broadly and, and become more active. I wanted to put in a comment with the Sunrise Movement. Supposedly they're in this major transition point um, they've been from like several months getting feedback from members about like how to how to change their structure to become more horizontal than vertical and then possibly changing the the age focus from youth to all you know ages and then also even to embrace uh, democratic socialism was I know and and so I'm waiting to see that's been in the works and they said springtime would be the time that they would announce the results, you know, with their with their membership. So I just want to throw that in since you put a link for Sunrise and since the person from Sunrise didn't wasn't able to join, I just wanted to throw that out because they're they're in a big transition point. Yeah, thanks for naming that, Nina. I actually didn't know that. I'm a very big fan of horizontal structures. Um, so good. That's a good thing. Yeah, I'll um, second that too, um, that I, my contacts at the Chicago location have now sort of spread out and they're, they're seeming like they're developing, they're already in process of creating horizontal structure, I was told, but I'm not getting a lot of calls back yet when I put in to try and pull them into our coalition, so. Yeah. I know Sunrise, it sounds like they're pretty overwhelmed in general. Like I know Claudia, the person who's supposed to come, is actually like running the campaign for someone running for state senate. So like, I can understand why she's busy. Um, this is actually kind of an interesting opportunity for me. Um, I'd really, I think this is the perfect space for me to kind of pose a question I've been asking in a lot of activist spaces lately, which is sort of what do we imagine would be the world we want to create sort of post climate with climate catastrophe, right? I think there's sort of the optimistic lens and then there's sort of the lens of like, well, if everything goes wrong, what do we do? And so I'm curious what you all think if within the next year, like what world do we wanna create now that we are living in the world of climate catastrophe? What do we think the world should look like instead of what it looks like now? And this can even tie into militarism, US imperialism. Obviously we wanna decolonize, but what, I don't know. I just, I'd love to hear your thoughts as climate groups, as anti-war groups, what you think. I have two thoughts, not necessarily um, full solutions or, but, but maybe ideas to work off of. One is to create broader coalitions amongst all advocate, advocacy groups, um, not just, um, not just climate, not just peace, um, but large groups that are working 
um, on a grassroots level to influence legislation um, to be to put our primary focus to publicly funded elections entirely funded publicly um, because I just feel like the reason that we're all having to individually lobby on all these different issues is because our go our government isn't responsive to us. Um, it's it's evidenced to me clearly by the fact that 75 to 85 percent of Americans want Medicare for all, and we can't even get our government to touch it. Um, and uh, the second thought I have is, you know, I'm I'm 48 years old. I've been out of high school a long time. But, and I don't know what high school curriculum is like these days, but the more I learn um, primarily on Twitter about things, that's, that's where I'm getting my, my civics education. Um, I, I'm so angry that I didn't learn any of this in college even. Um, and uh, I feel like I, I attended a, a meeting um, of ministers in Proviso Township. Um, they meet once a month. Um, they're called. Uh, I'll, I'll I'll put their their website in the chat later. But they were able to organize a change in curriculum for the Proviso Township high schools, which are two, and they now have uh, a whole semester of Black history um, in high school, just just Black history. Um, and so I feel like maybe contacting them and figuring out what model they've used to, to work towards changing um, education and then trying to like maybe expand that out. Those are two ideas I've had. So. They're pretty big, Carolyn, pretty big. I like them. Uh, can I throw a comment up? Um, <clears throat> reading about government like the military response and government response to climate change that one of the I, i'm wondering that if one of the reasons that they keep throwing more money into the military budget is that the military budget includes agriculture too and that there's some things that the military budget includes that that most people aren't aware of and that what they're doing is they're throwing money into worst case scenario okay so they're they are currently funding worst case scenario rather than throwing all the money into preventing further climate change is kind of what it seems like um, to me. I, I, there's a, the, do you, does the veterans guy, Gary, do you have any comment about that? Any yeah, I, I do as a matter of fact, and, and that is something that we address in our presentation because is it greening of the military or greenwashing of the military? And how much is actually being spent on climate mitigation and how much is being spent on making them quote, more efficient. And um, one of the attitudes that the military takes is that they see climate change as a threat multiplier. And they do have, uh, one of their strategy is called the armed lifeboat strategy where, you know, many um, first world nations have erected border fences as a means of helping to repel refugees, which are predicted to be in the millions and more uh, as climate catastrophe gets worse. But, you know, when we look at the budget, uh, I think it, we're looking at 790 or 814, depending on you know what the newest numbers are. But that doesn't include uh, money for nuclear weapons. It doesn't include veterans benefits. If you put everything together, it's it's about 1.3 trillion dollars. So the military, uh, they would like to say that they're they're greening, and of course they're going to ask for more money to you know come up with an electric tank or something. But at the end of the day, uh, their purpose is still the same, and that's to, quote, win wars. And uh, so that doesn't surprise me that, you know, they're trying to secure a food supply because they're working off of fear, and they're not looking at doing anything for mitigation. So I, I hope that gives you a little bit of insight. I, I would just like to add what I what I would like to see is 
more women in power. I mean, uh, this aggressive, violent uh, society that we have and is just got to come to an end. Yeah, thanks folks for sharing their thoughts. Um, it's something, um, I think those are very good responses. Um, we have about five minutes left till we're transitioning. So I can kind of keep the floor open. I know, um, so if any organizations wanna talk about space for collaboration or just ask questions, um, now's the time to do it. Yeah, I'm really, really interested in your prompts. Liz. It's like, maybe we can connect later offline about what you ask your students because I have a couple of visioning sessions coming up later like I did just move to Evanston I feel like we could be doing so much stuff like I was going down to Pilsen for all the line three stuff and that's far right you can't really build something with someone who's like an hour and a half away it's just not like in terms of building a community that's actually engaged with itself so I want to do like more local organizing I'm kind of trying to power map my whole community and figure out like who the people, I keep getting put in touch with random people like this person is working on the Carvana Tower, this person is working on implementation and like this person does this and, and everyone's like too busy. And I kind of want to bring everybody together. I thought that's what you were going to say, Carolyn. And then you said like everybody, ever. I just mean everybody who like cares about climate change and water and lives within a three mile radius of my house. I don't even think they know each other. It's so, so that's to me would be interesting to create. There was this one extinction rebellion event like three years ago in this bar. I don't know if any of you were there. There were like 40 different organizations there. They just got the back room and like everyone came and they were like, and that was what went into the like October 2019 event in, you know, downtown, like the big climate action. And it was so cool. And then COVID happened. But I feel like that's so interesting to just get enough people together that can represent and like come up with big, like we're all going to come to each other's events. We're not going to plan events on the same day if we can avoid, you know what, it, just that kind of thing. So I, that, that to me is so interesting. I don't know how to do it, but. So let's use my, my group as, as, a, as the umbrella for that. That's kind of what it was intended. We're, we have meetings right now set up every Thursday, at, uh, sorry, uh, the th third Thursday of every month at 7 p.m. And I, the idea was just to try to get any group that's working on climate related issues to come and, and tell each other what they're doing. So if you want to try to do that, we could, send out a, a blast. That was such an effective question. Okay, great. Yeah, would you just have me your phone number or something, Carolyn, before yeah. we go away? I, I don't know if anybody else is into it. And I keep trying to go to Rising Tide, but it's at the Humboldt Park Boat House on Monday nights at seven, right? It's like a pretty, I like have high hopes every week. It used to be. Um, oh, okay. Right it now on? it's right now it's just online. So it, it's kind of, um, yeah, like the beginning of the pandemic until summer 2020, it was all online. And then that summer, we did a lot of kind of moving around to different locations. Um, and then we we decided, you know, with like who with our current membership, um, the humble part boat, boathouse was um, like central, pretty much um, and like easy enough for people to get to. So we did that. But now, you know, when it's cold, it's we just do it online. And I don't really know what we're going to do this year. But when we do meet in person, we um, have an online option also. Um, just because like, I mean, I think, I think that should have happened before the pandemic. And I think we should continue even when it is safe to be in person because it's like more accessible, um, and disability justice is important. And, uh, yeah. so yeah, it would like right now we're just, we're still doing zoom and then, oh, that's good to know. Yeah. Cool. And if we move to in person, we will continue to like have a computer or phone logged into zoom for people to do that also. Thanks. Thanks, Liz. Good job. I mean, sorry, go ahead, Carolyn. But good job, Liz. You did a lot of work. Thank you. I had a question, Gary, about the HRES 767. It, will that be a binding resolution or is it a No, it's not. Okay. But it's interesting in, in that two years ago in the NDAA, there is a clause that the military does start to report their emissions. So this kind of reinforces it. And uh, uh, incidentally, all federal agencies have been under law to pass a, a financial audit. And the military, the Pentagon has put off even being audited for years. But 
it has undergone three financial audits and it has failed each of the three audits. So, uh, you know, they get a lot of money and they really can't account for how they spend it. It's like decades that they haven't been audited, like, like successfully, isn't it? It's like an enormous, there's an enormous amount of time that they've not been audited. To, to my understanding, what I read. I'm sorry, I missed the first part of that. Oh, it was it, my understanding that it's been, it's been decades since there's been a successful audit um, for the military. Well, they've never had, they've only been audited three times and they have failed each of the three. So they, they delayed even being audited uh, successfully for years while other federal agencies complied with the law. But they have failed each of the, each of the audits that they've undergone and there've only been three. Gary, just as a, oh, I'm sorry. No, I, I'm just going to say, I, personally, I find that really annoying. <laughs> yes. Well, I, I just wanted, as a follow-up, do you know if it was NDAA 2020 or 20, that, that, the, that was? 20, I believe it was 2020, but I, I'll check and, and, and uh, get back to you which okay. one it was. I want to tweet it out. So. Okay. Well, thanks, y'all. I'm really glad these connections are happening. I'm so glad. There's just like, I'm a big fan of like, I think, I um, can't remember which one of you said it, but just like the importance of just literal spaces for activists to just meet each other. Um, Cause that's when like these ideas happen, right? Like these collaborations. Um, so I'm just really glad. I don't know, I'm, I know some of you, um, Nina, I've never met you before. Gary, I've never met you before. Jesse, we spoke on the phone once. Aaron, I met you once. Um, so it's really nice to like, I don't know, just connect to, and hopefully new collaborations form. And again, bug me too about stuff. If you want to work with Kappa. We do. Yes.